Welcome to Dialogue in Diaspora this beautiful Monday man, morning. My name is Tunde Alabi. It's a pleasure having you on the show today. This program is designed to take a look at the role of the diaspora community in the United Kingdom, our responsibilities as members of the diaspora community, responsibilities in the United Kingdom, and of course, responsibility to the Nigeria um, community in Nigeria or wherever we may be. Uh, this is a program where we take a look at issues around politics, economy, and of course, social development. My name is Tunde Alabi. This morning, we have a special guest in the studio joining us to take a look at uh, diaspora engagement uh, from the United uh, Britain perspective and of course because of our role as the chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group in Nigeria, I should be taking a look at this uh, diaspora engagement even from the Nigeria perspective. Joining me on the program today is Meg Leah Ebi, the chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group here. Nigeria in the studio. Thank you. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Tunde. All right. Um, let, let's start this way, Meg. Um, the diaspora involvement, Nigeria diaspora involvement in UK politics and economy, social development. What is your assessment? How do you want to take a look at it? Well, I think in terms of um, a profession's work education, Nigerians are an incredibly successful diaspora group. I, mean, I think in professional terms, Nigerians come in second only to Americans in success rates. And um, children I met you know, at school 10 years ago when I was first elected as an MP, I'm now barristers, doctors, and, and you know, running parts of the, of the country. So I think there's been huge success. And I think it's partly because parents and children prize education so much. It's no accident that there's a conflation of my schools in my area in Hackney doing very well and a large Nigerian and West African population because that prize of education is really uh, shining through. I think there's still some areas that, that the Nigerians are yet to conquer. Uh, we have quite a lot of Nigerians now on television, um, in not just in Ben TV but elsewhere. But I do think that there's probably in the visual arts some of that hasn't come through so strongly. We're seeing more novelists and, and so on, so the arts are getting stronger. But I think that... You know, we, we will look back at this era, certainly in my constituency, and I think the impact on Britain over time as a golden era, really, for improving uh, attainment and achievement through the, the example that the Nigerian diaspora have set. Uh, we do face some challenges, <coughs> including um, being able to get involved in UK politics. Yes, we do mm. understand that a co couple of Nigerians in the political yeah. era. But of course, um, th those challenges of active participation in UK politics is there. Wh wh why do you think um, we have these challenges in the black community, especially yeah. not being involved? Well, you, in you touch on, a, on an issue that's absolutely in, uh, crucial, I think, and, and very important to me, because I look at the, you know, sitting in a parliament that looks very like a, well, very like a club of, of still of white men. We have, we're a bit more diverse now. And as you rightly say, we now have two uh, Nigerian origin MPs, Chiyong Wura from Newcastle Central and Chukwu Muna from Streatham, South, South London. So that's a good step. But I do work with um, a group set up by Councillor Kate Onlu uh, of uh, Edmonton, uh, of Enfield Council. She was the former mayor there. Um, she set up a group to help encourage particularly women from the uh, African diasporas, uh, from the Caribbean diasporas, and uh, from Asian diasporas to encourage them to get on in politics. And I think the danger is that political parties Parties, though they don't like to admit it, become little clubs of people who get involved. And very often, if you're not in that club, you don't know the rules, you don't know how to get engaged and then get selected. So one of the things all our parties need to do is be much more open about the process and reward people who are on merit who have got the chance to contribute. But I say, I say this, and we should be, shouldn't be too gloomy. In my own borough, we've got some very uh, top politicians, people like Councillor Susan Fajana Thomas, who was a former Speaker of Hackney. Uh, we had Shadi. Uh, um, Bright, who's uh, now a councillor in Barking and Dagenham, was also a speaker of Hackney. So we've got some pretty powerful politicians at local level. The question is about the breakthrough to the national level. But I don't think it's very far off coming. Mm. I think there are there's plenty of talent out there. But we still need to do more to make sure that our elected bodies, be they at local level, London level, or national level, truly represent the London that we all live in. But I think that's just a part. The, the other part that actually concerns most the, most of the diaspora members in the in the 
diaspora community to be voting. If they hardly come out to vote. Well, um, actually, well, my area they do. Yeah. I think, I think uh, in my area they do. One of the concerns I've got is that um, we had we saw the last mayoral elections, and of course we've got London mayoral elections next year. We saw a very racially divided vote, where basically if you're from a black or minor ethnic minority, you voted Labour, mm -hmm. and if you were not, you voted Conservative. There was a bit of overlap, but that was very broad, the biggest divide we've seen for several generations uh, in uh, London, and that was a real concern to me. Certainly, I don't sense any lack of engagement with politics, both among young people and more established older, you know, older Nigerians in my constituency. There's a couple of bus stops. If I stand at them long enough, I'll have more conversations about Good Luck Jonathan than I will about David Cameron, it's true. But there's a real in, in, an interest and engagement. I think the, the thing is that we've got to not ever get complacent in politics, and you've got to keep reaching out. And the day that you get comfortable in your political environment, you must remember, I always think, I've got to remember there's somebody out there who's not part of this club that's, that or this environment or this comfort zone. I've got to find the person who's excluded, who's out there, who's not getting in. And I think if you know, if there are people listening today who feel that they're excluded from the political process, I'd be really interested to hear what they've got to say. That is, of course, if they're not so excluded that they're not listening to this in the first place. May I ask you, what's your opinion about immigration? Immigration. I think we, we have got a very sad situation in this country where the word immigrant has become um, a bad word and it's become a word that has, is laden with racist over, uh, overtones and undertones. Um, and I think that my party should be much stronger about pointing out the value of immigrants to this country. We've always championed people who uh, are working hard, who, um, and that's, if you look at in the pattern of immigrants, uh, they're actually hardworking. Uh, they come here usually to seek work or to seek asylum of course in some cases but there is not it's not a light reason that people choose to come to the UK and I think we must not let this view that immigrants are scroungers taking benefits ever take deep root I'm very very concerned about the rhetoric of that awful party UKIP which is incredibly uh, divisive um, the words that Nigel Farage spoke the other week are outrageous and he um, is a man who's going to do great damage to the cohesion of this country Day to day, people who work and live alongside people who've come from overseas to work in our country and live in our country don't, I think, agree with him. Of course, he gets traction in parts of the UK where they've probably never seen a black face, or hardly, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's the worry. He's creating division, um, nasty division, where it need not exist, and I'm very angry. I think more of us need to stand up and say that louder, um, and I'm concerned that immigration is becoming fo a focus in the election that's not in, not in a helpful way because we are in a danger of following UKIP's lead and trying to talk about immigration in some way the way he does and that's wrong. We need to be positive and proud. I want to see a fair and firm immigration system so people who come here and want to contribute can do so. People who come here seeking asylum uh, get that chance to do that. Um, and you know, clearly there are rules, there have to be rules in any case, but the idea that everyone's coming here to scrounge is just ridiculous and certainly not my experience in my constituency. The, the latest earnings report I said that in London we've got more um, ethnic minority now mm. than the white. Yeah. Um, in terms of how do you value to the British economy, how much of it do you think that yeah. the ethnic minority Oh, I think it's incredible. I mean, if you take, just let's go back to immigration, if you take people who've, who've come to the UK from overseas, what they're bringing is a perspective of the world to this world city that is London and to the UK, which likes to play its role in the world. Now, if and also, you know, let's face it, if the UK cannot accept people who it once colonised and had in its empire, then that is that shameful. But the, the, what I say to children in schools in Hackney um, very clearly is when you look at the businesses in Silicon Roundabout, uh, as it's often called, Shoreditch in my constituency, they want to conquer the world. And if they're going to do that, they just need to go into a Hackney school, they'll meet children who speak every language, who, whose parents or that indeed they have come from a range of different countries including West Africa and these are areas that those companies need to understand if they are going to expand so the potential for um, the, the growth of our business sector alone uh, is, is enormous. Then you take the health sector and we have uh, an NHS that is staffed very uh, heavily by people who were not born in the UK but that also brings a knowledge and an understanding of the people they're going to treat, of the social and health issues of those populations. So I think that there is really the real benefits of having a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multinational, multi-faith city are enormous 
but more of us need to be shouting about that. And I really hope that the London mayoral elections rise above what I'm finding very distressing about this national election, and we actually start talking about the positive nature of migration. But you mentioned about the majority and the, f the figures of ethnic minorities in London over white uh, populations. Actually, of course, the biggest growing group in the UK is mixed race, which is a sign of the way things are. People are people. Um, people fall in love with people. People have children, and that's the growing group. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a sign that most people are just getting on with their lives, working and living alongside people of all backgrounds, and they're not getting in, in a twist about it. And Mr. Farage is just mining a very nasty scene, which I find appalling. Let's go back to education. What we were mm -hmm. talking, you spoke about the pride of an average world. Yeah. Let me not let me to Nigeria of a black no, community yeah. sending their children to higher institutions, mm -hmm. getting them good education. Um, well, what's the kind of a policy of your party on education? O on this basis, that's this where I'm coming from. Yeah. Uh, of the top 10 universities in the UK, um, the children from the ethnic community struggle to get into the top yeah. 10 universities. It just goes back to what I was saying about closed clubs. As soon as an environment feels comfortable, somebody in that environment should be saying and challenging themselves to say, we feel all very comfortable, everyone knows each other. Where are the people who don't feel comfortable in this environment? And I think it would be very tough, however confident, however academically qualified and brilliant you are to be one of a handful of black faces in a white college at an Oxford University or whatever. But those universities tell me they want people on merit, but they don't perhaps always appreciate the social side of that. But though now, you know, I have to say there are many uh, children from schools in Hackney now going to these good universities who are from a range of backgrounds. So time will change this. But I think it's important that we do, we have initiatives like what we have in, the, in Hackney, the Red Room. This is where the local sixth form college has a room set up like a, uh, a study of an Oxbridge tutor. Mm -hmm. And pupils go in and they have a pretend interview with a real Oxbridge tutor and they're asked questions. But the environment isn't like uh, you know, their home in Hackney or their school in Hackney. It's more like it would be if you went to a uni an old-fashioned university. So they're not phased by that. And I think we do need to equip all our young people, whatever their background, with what sometimes people call the soft skills of how you look someone in the eye when you shake their hand, the sort of things that that person would expect of you. And to some extent, you have to meet those expectations to cross the threshold. And um, one young man said to me, well, don't you believe in meritocracy? I said, absolutely. And he said, so isn't it terrible if you try and network um, to try and get yourself in front of people? And I said, well, you can be as brilliant as you are, but if you don't go and tell people that and they never meet you, then they'll never know. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to help young people get across that bridge, if you like, to, sh to be able to display their talents. Certainly there's talent there. But I do think that, yeah, there are little hidden secret codes that exist in any club or group or organisation that need to be challenged. And I think we need to, people like me uh, and, and you uh, and others need to be making sure we're challenging that. But those institutions crucially need to challenge from within. So what I would say to somebody is if you are I'd let's say the first Nigerian in your Oxford College, or um, probably not the first these days. Actually, that's that's probably happened a long time ago. But you know, you're one of a handful of people. Then you need to be, you know, it's um, maybe you want to just get on and do your business and do your studying, or your you work in your work environment. But you do need to challenge. And I met recently some people from one of the top accountancy firms, um, and then there were enough. Uh, Africans coming into that firm to uh, persuade the firm to set up an Africa business group and they have really actually helped the firm grow by taking on projects in Nigeria where they're going to be employing a lot of people but not just Nigeria across uh, the African continent different nations um, and they um, but they had the, they felt they needed to stand up and say something needs to be done here and they've also made sure they've supported other staff as they've come through. So I think we all have a responsibility is really what I'd say in summary. Now that I was listed to Ed Miliband talking about um, helping, not even, I said it was on Thursday or Wednesday uh, to run um, BME employment around table mm, for a while yes, yeah, yeah. and then he was talking about the poor rate of employability of people from the ethnic background. Why do, why are we still faced we, that kind of a challenge in this century, at this age, we have people looking at probably our colour, our first name, and before they consider us for... No, I think it, it's very interesting. And about six or seven years ago, the, I think it was the Running Need Trust did a, an experiment where they sent out the same CV, but with different names attached. So they tried to choose names that looked like they could be Caribbean or uh, Asian, and they had other uh, white... British names and the difference in the number of people who got interviews um, who, from white backgrounds compared with black backgrounds was 
incredible and really showed that there is a, a hidden prejudice that is still abroad. One of the issues that I have felt and quite strongly about is this issue of accent. Um, sometimes, and I think the English have a lazy way of listening to people. Uh, I mean, my, most of my African friends speak better English than many of the English, but with a strong accent, people who don't bother to listen sometimes tune out and have, have a prejudiced view, uh, certainly on the basis of colour, as you say. It is shameful that in 2015 we're still getting results like that on employment. And I think we need to look really closely at why that is. Clearly there must be some prejudice involved, but there may be things that can be tackled. So one of the things we've tackled, for instance, in my own borough, is the schools, and, and across London in fact, schools have massively improved. When I was first elected as MP 10 years ago, there were very few children from Hackney going to university. Now we have 15 offers just this year to go to Oxford and Cambridge alone, let alone the other universities, and they are from a range of backgrounds. They're not all white children. So by getting the education right, making sure that the children are qualified, they've studied you know, the right way, then no one said, oh, you're just a child from Hackney or you're just a black kid, you don't count. That there's a real emphasis and, and in the, um, a focus on each child as an individual with talent who can achieve. And that has made a big difference. And that will, I think, be one of the ways we can do it. There's an interesting issue with older men. And I think some men uh, in their, particularly in their 50s, um, black and, and some white men too, who left school perhaps at 15, 16 without qualifications, got a job worked hard at it, but then the world has changed and they now need to prove things with a certificate, with an ID, and they maybe don't have a passport, they don't have a driving licence, they're suddenly left behind. So I think there's a real issue around that older cohort, mm -hmm. um, which is probably less Nigerian than it is Caribbean, which mm -hmm. uh, certainly is less than that. But I mean, I meet Caribbean and white men in, in Hackney who have that problem. As a party, um, uh, is there kind of a policy formulation that Labour mm -hmm. will put in place should they be elected into power. Um, yes, there is one of the things. Do do the government has um, reduced the use of what we would call an equality impact so statement. So, if I was a minister making a policy, I would ask not in, when Labour was uh, in government, or if Labour in government again, we would ask. Uh, that the civil service to say who would this affect most and who would this, you know, who would this affect badly and the, this government's not so interested in that and I think that it, so that's a really crucial thing it makes policy makers think at every step and know at every step when they make a policy decision who it's going to impact on positively who it's going to help who's going to lose out because of it and then they have to make the decision about whether that's then still justified but if it throws up that it's going to have a negative impact on people then uh, that's an issue but i think one of the challenges is that often politicians or whitehall make decisions that they think are right and they don't really follow through what's happening on the ground and we need a much faster turnaround of information from the grassroots back to Whitehall so we can change things when they're not working, when they are affected. Because if you get it wrong for a generation, that's a huge impact on that generation. Like take stop and search. I meet men my age still angry because they were stopped and searched a lot as teenagers. And so when they're stopped now, they, the anger comes back. That's a big damage to a generation. So I think we've really got to be clear about being able to change policy quicker when it's not working. All right, I've got somebody on the line. Yeah. Good morning. You're welcome to the program. I've got Megia, MP, Chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group in Nigeria, and of course, MP for Acme, live here in the studio. Your name and where you're calling from? My name is Bakari. Your name is? Bakari. Okay. Bakari, you're welcome to the program. From Lexington. Okay, from Lexington. Mm -hmm. Go on, Bakari. Well, my contribution is towards. Uh, Education. Okay. Say, I don't know why uh, what is good for God should be given to God and what is good for sister should be given to sister. This is a practical example I'm going to say now. I have a, a grandson in heaven. This boy, since he started school, he always comes forth in the school. Okay. So when he does a very plus, to go to grammar school, the boss was laid down and the one was crying. I told the mother, let me take her son. He said, no, 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 that's no worry. This boy, there are somebody in his class of which that boy was a class of the class. Not with the standard of that, that my grandson. 
and they uh, that was taken into grammar school. And the boy was crying that look, I know my performance, why did they take me to them? Then I said to him, listen, in teaching grammar school you go not matter. It is your input, your competence, how you study hard and so and so on that will make you. So don't bother about when you if, uh, whether you are admitted in grammar school or not. If you go to the worst school and you come back to a gold and silver, it's better. So these kind of things, I think, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of my uh, neighbor, but I think uh, if they want to win the next election, I want them to eradicate all this stupidity. If one sister to sister and one want to fall. But there are discrimination I know is inevitable, but still. Then the children that are going to be prime minister of this country, let them carry on to have good education, have good qualification, and then the proper that they want to be come to. But if we keep on pressing them down, I don't think it's good because they are born in this country, they carry the flag of this country, they are British, you know. All right, Michael. Thanks so much. Let me allow. Let's let's allow uh, Meg to to. to yeah, th th that's issue of discrimination. Yeah, yeah. Even at such a small. Well, I think I mean, Michael. I think you're hitting a lot of issues there. One is that selecting at 11 is very challenging, and very um, can be very pressured on young people. Uh, so I don't agree with that approach. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right, Bakari, to, to say to your grandson, believe in yourself and keep working hard and it's your personal achievement that matters. But look, I think we need to make sure every institution is looking at its colour, its makeup, um, to make sure that, it, you know, that under the last Labour government, we introduced measuring children's achievement by their ethnic breakdown. Mm. So uh, we could measure the difference between, say, African girls and Caribbean girls, that's specifically Turkish and Kurdish, and certainly in fact we would do that, but then nationally there were these breakdowns which meant a school, a school could be challenged if it was in an area that was very mixed but was all white, that would be an issue. If it was in an area that was very Asian but was all Caribbean, that would possibly be an issue. So you need to make sure that we're, you're looking at that and constantly challenging. And certainly that is something that Labour's committed to, Bakari. But I think you're, from what you're saying, your grandson, if he's doing so well, with the drive from you um, and his parents, um, I have every great hope for. But it's, it's challenging for a child to deal with that disappointment, which is one of the reasons I think we shouldn't really have that selection at 11. Mm, absolutely not. Okay, now let's look at um, let's let's go to Nigeria um, mm. and APPG. Mm. You're the chair of APPG. What is APPG and what does APPG do? Okay, well, the all-party parliamentary group on Nigeria was set up uh, in around 2001, actually to deal with the Niger Delta, but very quickly became the group for Nigeria. It's a group made up of politicians from both House, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, of all parties, and indeed none, so cross-bench cross peers can be involved as well. We're not funded by government, we're not funded by the Foreign Office, we are independent of government, but we are officials that we are, uh, as, uh, you know, Parliament allows us to exist. And we seek to visit Nigeria and to learn about Nigeria and to make sure that we're both educating other British MPs uh, about Nigeria, speaking positively for Nigeria, but also being a critical friend. Um, because, you know, I love Nigeria, but I have many frustrations about Nigeria as well. And we're not afraid to voice those as and when. What we don't do is tell the Nigerian government what it should be doing day by day. So we don't comment on every single policy of the Nigerian government because it is a government that is elected, a parliament that's elected, and we wouldn't expect people to do that to us. But we try to develop a bit of an expertise, really, in the British Parliament and speak up for Nigeria to remind people about the positives as well as the challenges. You say you've got some frustrations about Nigeria. You want to tell us some of your frustrations about Nigeria? Well, where do we start? Well, I think one of, I mean, the, big, anyway. the biggest frustration <laughs> is corruption. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I just think it makes life daily so difficult. And it was um, difficult because to get about your business yeah, nearly everybody in some point has a brush with having to pay somebody something to speed it up, whether it's going through a road and paying the police officers or you know, to get your business contract or maybe your child's school place or whatever. The, the, these are, are real challenges. But I think the, the other uh, concern I have is, uh, you know, we have a political class who are many of whom are doing, you know, I do meet many who are doing a good job, but they are paid a lot more than, say, a British MP. Mm. Um, and I do remember one not very edifying meeting with a group of, Brit of Nigerian politicians. I was on a visit, and they wanted to lobby me because they felt that British Airways was charging too much money for a first-class 
flight to London from Lagos. Uh, I didn't think this was the biggest <laughs> issue of concern when we went out there trying to discuss you know, training young people, the future of the economy in Nigeria. I was actually frankly appalled um, that that was a high priority. And I have to say, I didn't really know much about turning left on an aeroplane until I began to go to Nigeria and I'd meet people and they'd turn left and I'd turn right. Um, and they were in first class at great expense. And I think, you know, when you're paid by the taxpayer, which Nigerian politicians are, I am, you have to think about, you know, who you're serving and how you do that. Is there any way anything Britain has done on this train or can do to help Nigeria deal with this? Yeah, I think this, of course. I've been uh, impressed. We have Metropolitan Police based in um, our consulate there who, uh, the Bribery Act and um, some of the, and the laws we have here in the UK, the, you know, dealing with money laundering and so on, actually have helped the Nigerian government tackle some of those things. It, it's interesting that James Iboui went through a British court. I mean, you know, he's one person, but that was a big significant step, I think, that somebody did get prosecuted for uh, ill-gotten gains. Now, you know, we need to do more. I think some of these things are now more complex internationally nationally because you know, especially with the Naira being a weak currency especially at the moment you know people will especially those who've got lots of money will seek to you know go into sterling or dollars so I'm sure there are issues in the United States as well where people are trying to hide their money so I think we've got to collaborate um, I think there are also big issues and we've talked about other issues that, that concern me trafficking human trafficking is it's the biggest source country for human trafficked people to the UK and there are a lot of people along that chain who make money that is something I'm really pleased there's been leadership from uh, actually this government government, to be fair, has taken a, a, a strong lead on this as, as with support from Labour. Um, we've also seen uh, the Catholic Church take a big lead on, on this. So there's some real movement now, but it's still a very big, difficult issue to tackle. And, you know, then the other issue, I think, is around generally around human rights, um, particularly, actually, if you look at the rights of women, if women had stronger rights and were able to exercise them, then there would be much better issues for children um, and generally for Nigerian society. So there's a lot to, do, to be done. But the positives, the positives, you know, Nigeria is a country full of of people who are very ambitious um, committed to their education um, and who really I mean, the potential for Nigeria is enormous I mean you know Africa's most populous nation uh, economy that is growing I just think if, we, if Nigeria could diversify more away from oil allowing businesses to flourish and tackle corruption there's so much potential oh, there's so much potential for Nigeria I've got and that's why I'm so sad because there's so much potential <laughs> and so many problems <laughs> If, 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 your listeners are if you're so sad, I mean, the, what, what do you think we will be? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've got somebody on the line. Good morning, you're welcome to the show. Your name and where you're calling from. Good morning. Oh, <coughs> hello, good morning. Good morning, madam. Yeah, my name is Julia. I'm calling from Birmingham. Julia from Birmingham. Birmingham. Yeah. Okay, go on. Oh. Madam, could I ask you to turn down the volume of your TV set? Just talk straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello? Yes, go on. Yes. Um, I'm just trying to call because uh, this is a, I'm living in the UK for like 2001. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, I don't know, I practiced for 20 years in one of the hospitals. Yeah. That they are still a part of the year. I practiced very well, they know me as medical nurse. I moved to Birmingham, which is I do the transmission test, they have to do, I do it. And I went to one of the security committee offices to do the interview. And when I finished my interview, they called me back and said, oh, I'm sorry, you cannot get the job, which is ironic. I've been in practice for 12 years in the one of the before I moved. And I got all the concentration on the business, you know, I got, I'm in Nigeria business, you know. Yeah. I got all the concentration, I can do everything, the dark sky, everything. But when you get your assets, you know, because the people who interview you, they dodge it and they don't give you jobs. Do you believe as still practice as agency, every hospital, because I have my confidence to go everywhere to work, they to secure. One year back, after I left my hospital, that they know me where, they, my manager gives me good records everywhere. I couldn't get it, I'm going to get it, get back. Julia, I'm really distressed by that because I... Thank you, Julia, uh, for, for your contribution on the program. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm really distressed because I do think that there is a... And it demonstrates, Julia, that there's still an issue around people being prejudiced by accent. People should look at the skills someone's got. Actually, you know, I'm, I'm, I do have this theory that the English have a lazy ear. We don't listen well. You know, if, if something sounds a bit different, we can't be bothered. Um, I remember one example, actually, years ago, Julia, if it makes you if it's any better. And I was a young woman working between someone who was from Portsmouth on the south coast who spoke 
uh, well, not distinct English, I think it would be fair to say, I, I come from there, so I can say that, but with a, a lot of glottal stops, very much from the front of the mouth. And a, a man from Glasgow, with a strong Glaswegian accent, who spoke very clearly, but with an accent, and they couldn't understand each other. And I was translating, and I think they could understand each other. One was speaking to not very clearly, so I think I felt more sympathy for the Glaswegian, but the Portsmouth guy couldn't really tune in to an accent. And so I think now we see this very much with many people from parts of Africa with strong accents. And I'm distressed, Julia, that it's so apparent now. But look, keep trying, because if you're an agency nurse and you're working and you've got all these good references, somebody at some point will want to take you on. And actually Labour is prom promising a lot more nurses, a couple of hundred thousand more nurses in our hospitals, so there'll be more permanent positions. And I think they'll be mad, frankly, to turn down a woman with 12 years' experience who, let's be clear, and Birmingham is a, a multicultural city too, so many of the patients that you're dealing with are no doubt Nigerian too, so the accent is not going to be a problem for them. So I do hope that, um, you're, that the uh, Royal College of Nursing is helping you to challenge uh, this and making sure that they're watching what's happening um, in any of the hospitals you've applied to to make sure that, that this is being thought, of, thought through by people on interview panels. They're not just being prejudiced I mean, for the sake I, of I, it. I, I could say that this is just one example of so mm. many mm. acts of discrimination against black people yes. in the UK, mm. even in 2015. They are subtle, they are there, but mm. they are still very, very there. And I think it's interesting what Trevor Phillips was saying the other day. We should be able to talk about these issues because it's important we have this out, that we have a discussion about it, and that people can have these discussions in their workplace rather than just, I don't know whether Julia's taken this up with people when she's had this challenge at work, but it's hard for you to take it up for yourself. But if the culture of an organisation is, please come and talk to us if you're feeling uncomfortable or you feel challenged about uh, whether it be your race, uh, your gender, your sexuality, whatever, I think it's really important that people have the space to do that. So I think it is monitoring what's going on in organisations to make sure that there is a fair representation of the people who are applying or living in an area, tackling that by making sure there's action plans to do that, but also educating people. So if you're on an interview panel you know, and you haven't ever employed someone from a particular background or country, you should be learn to be aware of where your natural prejudices are. Everyone has a prejudice. We, they're built in to the way we see the world. We have our background we bring with us. But it's a question of challenging that and teaching people who are selecting right. people for positions for the university or jobs or whatever that they can actually challenge that. So I think it, it's a complex to challenge, but we, we mustn't just rail against it. We need to act. Otherwise, we'll just you know, not achieve anything. All right. Good morning. You're welcome to the program. Your name and where you're calling from. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. Your name, sir? My name is Ayo. I'm calling from uh, Manchester. Ayo from Manchester. Thank you, Ayo, for calling in. Go ahead and make your point. Yeah, I'm happy that uh, you get to say a position on your show now that people need to talk about prejudice. Yeah. We are not being fitted in this country. First thing is about the assets. Whether when you talk and your counterpart or your colleague will be saying that they don't listen to you. Yeah. And they are now talking back to you and they want you to just invite the different like that and act on it. This is a very gross way of unprofessionalism. This will be looking. It shows of a manner of uh, a matter to slavery way of doing things. If you don't have the idea of taking your time to listen to me, talking to you, you cannot just bounce it back onto my face saying that I can hear you. I can say the same thing to you, but if I can take time, have a kind of a tolerance in order to understand you properly, you should do the same. That is what I'm talking about here. Like the lady that just uh, been on the show saying about the issue concerning her deeply, in practice, you can justify that. If you imagine somebody that has been practicing in this country and finally will be saying that they cannot hear you talking. Whereas they are not the ones that they are doing, this lady will be treated. Mm -hmm. The lady will be treating some patients on the wall whereby they can listen to her and hear her properly. Are you getting me? Which means they are just debating her or trying to disenfranchise her for what she's supposed to do. This is the job she wants to do. And the panel and have the one dividing how to do it. Ayo, can I just can I just ask you before you go on? What what role Ayo what role do you think the diaspora community should play in dealing with this issue alongside um concerned MPs maybe from the different constituencies? We we, we are not we are not we are not doing it right here in Manchester now of having a one voice. 
you know, like uh, our brothers from the eastern part of the world, they already win that war with them in this country. You cannot play with any India or Pakistan in that manner. They won't go there yet. And these are the worst people that speak in this uh, language that you will find it very difficult to understand. It's only Africa or other persons that we are coming to now. And that is what we are talking about. This country should help in order to help us to, to, to mark down the attitudes of some of our colleagues in our world. Yeah. They always talk to us that they are superior. Okay, Ayo, thank you so much for your contribution. All right, Ayo. I agree with you, and I think standing up together is very important. And in fact, this Saturday afternoon, uh, the 20, uh, uh, sorry, not the 28th, two weeks' time, um, I'm going to be at St. John's Church in Hoxton, meeting many of the different diaspora groups, uh, Francophone Africans as well, because they have issues, uh, especially if you know, English is their third or fourth language, um, and they've got a, a French accent, French African accent. And we're going to be meeting to discuss a number of the these issues to sort of set, if you like, a manifesto for action. But it does need buy-in, I think you're right, Tunde, from the diaspora too. But I do, I, I sense, I mean, not just the frustration, but quite rightly, oh, the anger uh, of you and Julia and many others out there, because this is one of the reasons I was keen that the diaspora issues got embedded into the work of the all-party group, because I was getting cross that I met people from Nigeria um, and other parts of West Africa who had good degrees but were driving taxis or being security guards. Um, they don't knock any job because they're noble professions too, but their, but their accent was one of the big barriers for them getting work. The prejudice was there and is naked. And it sounds like it's still, well, I, I, know, I know from my own experience it still is, but it's depressing to hear that it's happening around the country too. And so again, we must make sure we're challenging institutions. But look, gets, let's make, make a movement about this. I mean, I've got this meeting in Hackney on the 28th of March, but there must be meetings going on around the country. Lobby your own MP. We as a, an all-party group can help take this up. Um, but we can't do it on our own. I was saying politics, you can't do it on your own, you need the help of the people, that's who you're there to represent. So, AO, Julia, keep involved, get active and, and, get, and tell us you know, what, what we should be doing. Yes, Meg, I, I think I've got something on the line now, so I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you that you were into cars, you, you are from a country that has one of the largest uh, black uh, yeah. people, even African community, ACNE, and also the chair of APPG. I wanted to ask you, where will we be playing in dealing with this issue? But before that, I've got so much on the line. Um, good morning, you all are to the program. Your name and where you're calling from? Hello, good morning. I'm a member of the Gazama, Councillor Gazama, thank you. You're welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you. I just want to. Where are you calling from? Yeah, I'm calling from Mother. Okay, from Mother. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I just want to comment uh, AP Mekhelia for her great passion towards Nigeria. Um, last time we, we went to her offices and we were welcomed, and then she took Nigeria's problem of form herself making sure that uh, she, she finds solutions to what is happening in Nigeria. She's always passionate about Nigeria, and uh, although such people are not easy to get, but uh, she's one of those people who are very uh, concerned whatever happens with Nigeria. So I think people are not complaining, but people should come out for people that are listening, please, they should go out there and vote for her in mass. That, that is just uh, what I want to say. And well done, thank you. Thank uh, you. I'm very grateful for what you have done for us, myself and my and my leader in Mark. So I believe that people will vote for you and you will come back. All right. Thank okay, Gazama, thank you so much. Uh, uh, politicians will be politicians. Okay, Gazama, thank you so much for calling in. Yes, I, I was saying we went into caps um, from the conscience of one of the largest uh, black uh, people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I met with Nigeria. Nigeria, I would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, are there things, even from your experience within your constituency, regarding the kind of discrimination at school or work? Well, I think at schools in Hackney, we now very much have a focus of schools focusing mostly on the individual child, but we must be vigilant. We must never accept that it's going to always be that way because, you know, you have um, people are only human. Uh, you have to have a very strong regime in schools and in the council and, and elsewhere to make sure that we're watching. As I always say, if you, don't, if you can identify a problem, you can usually solve it. Mm -hmm. You're an optimist. But if people sleepwalk into 
ignoring it and say that they're not recognising there are challenges, um, then there can be real issues. So I remember when I was a school governor some years ago now in a primary school, there were two um, boys who were then 10 or 11 who were, didn't want to go and see African dancers in their school assembly and they cried and sobbed and didn't want to go in. Now, there were two possible issues there that I immediately realised, but some of the young white teachers who just didn't have experience of African communities, it wasn't really their fault, they, they just didn't understand. Um, there was an issue about training, I think, but they were they either didn't want to because of witchcraft or because they weren't proud enough of their heritage to see it celebrated in front of others, both of which, whichever was true, were issues. And I know that there was a good head then who took that up and really made sure that the school was much more aware of it. But there were little prejudices. Again, in that same place, there were teachers who thought it was acceptable to make, um, they were doing the Wizard of Oz one year, and each class did an act. Every teacher at one point was had a little blonde white girl as Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Where about the little black girls? Now, you know, that had to be challenged. The head teacher challenged that and it changed. But if there's nobody challenging within or watching from outside, then you will see these problems. So I think that that's really important that we keep doing that. So one of the things I'm challenging is in my borough at the last elections, we had not enough candidates from black and minority ethnic backgrounds or indeed women coming through to stand as councillors. And I'm really putting more, even more effort into making sure I'm talking to people now about the next council elections, maybe even the next general election, so that they're ready and they know how to use the system, work through the system. Because people sometimes come to me and say, I'd like to be an MP now. And I say, well, have you done any work on this? And they haven't, and they didn't know how, they didn't know where to start, but they start too late. So it's really important that people like me don't just draw up the ladder, but actually extend a hand down and help people. Mm -hmm. And I really sincerely hope to day that when I one day leave my job, and I'm hoping to be re-elected at very kind of the council, <laughs> but, um, but, but if like, one day I do, I do leave, I, I think I would like someone who doesn't look like me to take the job, and I don't mean a man in a white suit, a man in a suit. <laughs> right. Okay, I've got somebody on the other side as well. Um, good morning, you're welcome to the program. Your name and where you're calling from? My name is Yinka. Yinka, thank you for joining us, Yinka. Where is Yinka calling from? I'm calling from Preston. From? Preston. Preston. From Preston, okay, Yinka, thanks. Go on. Uh, to be honest with you, the body language of the uh, yoga is in all parts. Like Cancel uh, or Gadama or other quite big in it. There's something about saying that uh, everybody from where this lady belongs to shoot. Come out and vote for her. You can imagine the way Amanda she now tried to bring the all of the African Caribbean into the system. And whereby majority of all the politicians in this country would not even have that I mean spelling to, to encourage people to do that. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We need to okay. encourage ourselves to come out yeah. in order to vote and see that we have our map in the in the state in this country. It's enough for us to sit on the fence and thinking that they are going to I mean I mean celebrate our our issues and bring it us into the fold. But what I want you to say is this it's about integrating our culture, our cultural heritage into the system. Because when we're talking about the uh, language and the accent, people believe that uh, maybe we are from the desert. But if we try as much as possible to come out in terms of uh, a drama presentation, I don't even believe that the uh, BBC will be able to show any of uh, African movies on their television. And we've already come of age, this is for the fourth century, that our movie our culture should be exposed and it is and people to embrace it. Yes, a lot of them have been taking our food and they love it because it's at their reach. <laughs> but when we are talking about our culture, this is another thing they need to embrace from us. Because culture is like a snail. All right, Yuka, I'm sorry, I need to let you gather up and see you've made your point. Yeah. Thank you, Yuka. Thank you, Yuka, for joining us. I respond week. to Yuka's point yes. about the same kind of what you're saying about me, but I think a lot of MPs won't know the strength of feeling among their Nigerian diaspora or indeed other African nations because perhaps they're not very big groups in their constituency. So it's really important that people show up, speak up 
and explain to politicians. I, I, uh, there's a lot of discussion in politics about whether or not we should be lobbied. I want to be lobbied by people. I want to hear people's point of view. Hence my um, African summit on the 28th of March, and I've done other events with individual diaspora groups. But you know, if I can't hear what you've got to say, I can't do my job. But equally, other MPs can't. So some will approach me for advice if they've been approached because they're just not um, knowledgeable enough about Nigeria, but, but, but they want to be educated. So I think there's a, so the, you know, there's a role for everybody who's watching today to go and sort of lobby and challenge and ask these questions. But I think um, there are... There are but, but the problem is how accessible is at this MP? We find it difficult Some, to reach yeah. them. Well, an MP difficult. shouldn't be difficult to reach because you know we should be available. I can give an example of a Labour MP mm. that's been very, very difficult to reach. Right, right. Just on the straight up. Right. Okay. Well, I, if I think if you're if you're talking about who I know, he's got a very, very top job, and he might be running this country. And I think that we should be very proud of his success. Absolutely. And I have had other sometimes people criticise me because somebody they believe should be available to them every day and actually done very well, and is also representing whether it be the Nigerian diaspora or the Caribbean diaspora, but is representing their roots and their their their, their group of uh, you know their, their, their where they've come from very effectively. So let's not knock success. You know, I think we should be proud of that success. But you know, um, that, but every politician on their, in their, certainly in their constituency, um, needs to be available, so that you know, because that's why we, we only do our business because we are elected. We have to listen to the people who elect us and reflect what we hear in Parliament. And I, and I think that is very much for me what the job is about. I, I think I like to say I'm doing a PhD in Hackney. <laughs> I know a lot about my area, and that's what I should. But I only know because I'm on doorsteps or talking to people in their kitchens or you know or in other ways. And I think it's really important. But look, yeah, and Yinka, you also raised an interesting issue about culture, and you mentioned there about food. I think one of the areas that the Nigerians haven't yet conquered in the UK is, is is restaurants. There's a few places you can get jollof rice in Hackney, but you know Nigerian cuisine hasn't really it hasn't quite. Ma I think they're the class between the British palate and the Nigerian palate is perhaps a bit marked and I think there's a bit of work to be done there. So there's a, there's a business opportunity for somebody who's listening is to, to extend the British palate so it's just alongside the Caribbean takeaways, the fish and chip shop mm. and the Indian takeaway. We've got some good but Let's go deep into <laughs> the Nigerian politics now. I mean, we haven't got the time, but mm. I think our colours have been so much interested in the UK mm. integration. Well, that says a lot, doesn't it? it speaks yes. Yes. So. Let, let's go deep into Nigeria. Yeah. I mean, it, this is a very critical moment for Nigeria. Yeah, absolutely. And I, my, I, you know, I was really nearly wept when the uh, uh, elections were postponed. In fact, they were going to be originally to on my birthday, the 14th of February, oh, yeah. Valentine's Day. And I thought, what a great birthday present it would be to have a very peaceful... Election. election and then it didn't happen so that was a bit of a blow for me on me personally but no but I think it is a sadness mm. because the last elections were so successful with people from the diaspora traveling back to vote and all compared with 2006 when I was out and for the first my first visit was in 2006 just before the 2007 elections the chaos with my neck there were, was immense you know there wasn't the preparation there wasn't the confidence and the confidence is much much more there now I mean obviously they've got to happen now by the 26th of April 20. Uh, tw well, they've got to have to happen so 20 8th of March is the date, so but they can't be delayed beyond the 26th of April, mm -hmm. and then the 12th of April for the governor uh, elections. So we'll hopefully be, uh, you know, celebrating a successful election in Nigeria and an election in the UK at the same time. Um, but it is really critical, and I meet and I've met recently with a group of Nigerians from the north, and obviously a lot of constituents from uh, Yoruba, particularly in Igbo from the south. And the the, the strength, the feeling about having a strong leader is really, I think, the, the one factor that cuts through all the other issues and tackling Boko Haram. I mean, that's what I'm getting from diaspora groups here, that they really want that to be the priority for the president, whoever it is after the election. But we must see these elections happen. They must be peaceful. Um, and whoever wins must do it gracious, gracefully and graciously. Whoever loses must concede defeat graciously because those two men have huge power. And if one of them loses and makes the wrong signals, that could fuel violence and tension, which would be disastrous. And with a country as large as Nigeria, disaffected, violent young people could have a devastating effect on the region. And when you think of Nigeria's importance in peacekeeping in the region, it will, it's really important that Nigeria itself manages its affairs and sets an example uh, mm. to, to the nations that have been having so many difficulties in West Africa. All right, I've got somebody on the side. Good morning, welcome to the program. Your name and uh, where you calling from? Your name? Uh, good morning, my name is Martin. I'm Hi, from Ireland. I'm born in Ireland. Hi. So I want to say... Good morning to the MP, Meg, 
and uh, obviously um, it's great to hear that Christine has uh, this kind of um, arrangement to uh, support and uh, partner, partner with Nigeria in, the, uh, in our uh, in, 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 in our life as a civilian. And the support to our government too, and people in the, in the UK there. It's a very good uh, uh, arrangement which I really appreciate. Um, one of the things that I want to uh, just comment on is that you know the relationship between Nigeria, the relationship relationship between UK and Nigeria has been ups and down for the many years. Um, uh, the number of our Nigerians feel that um, Europe has not, um, region has not been very supportive to Nigerian call to stop corruption despite of the fact that um, the Gori case and some other cases uh, have been handled critically. Um, I recall that I know that the um, Western world is not really in those days, not really like the military regime in the day that overtake, uh, normally overthrown democratically and the federal government. Uh, but in those days in Africa, um, the politicians become very impunity and uh, they do many things to the will of the people. And people are become uh, helpless and looking for a, a survival, somebody that will rescue them from the hands of the people. So, so Nigeria has been in this drama in, the, in our, our history. I recall very well in uh, 1983 that um, when the military that took over from Shakari was asking for British hands to extradite the Maldiko who was presumably lost to the part of Nigerian treasury. But even though was not supportive at that time, and that was what led to um, the, um, Nigeria being able to stay better uh, and the world. Get to this guy out of it, out of prison. So we expected that in those at that time, British would be able to have woken up and uh, be fair with Nigeria to help us address all these problems there. And it will Martins, can I, can I just ask you to go straight to either your question or your very short comment, Martins? Right. I, one of the things that I also want to say is that I don't want to be feeling rather than the way of reaching out or meeting our representative, so-called representative in Nigeria, with everyone who is the Nigerian diaspora in our House of Representatives, and the KW, with you as a maker and discuss issues regarding us uh, in the diaspora or rather in the UK. Well, right, Martins, I need to let you go at this point. Thanks a lot for calling in. Um, Quite a lot of oh, that's what she is, said, yes. is raised, yeah. but spoken more about the issue of corruption, yeah. and that not enough is coming from Britain to yeah. help Nigeria. I think Britain is certainly keen and willing. I think one of the challenges is that Nigeria has got to help itself too, and I think there's got to be political will and follow through because there's been political will a number of times with quite good people put in to tackle corruption, but the risks and and challenges for someone in uh, those top jobs is really challenging. So the president's weight behind that has got to be continued and resolute. Um, and it is a, di a difficult challenge. The way that Britain can help is that the law can, uh, the Br British law helps Nigeria tackle things, but it was very slow in the Abori case, and I think there's still more that could be done. And maybe just as we've had um, some international work done on trafficking, there maybe needs to be more international work done on corruption. A lot of what, what happens, Martin, and I was a minister in the Home Office so now a number of years ago, but it's a bit more under the radar than we can all, I would even know about now. So there is perhaps more happening than is visible, but maybe I think that visibility is quite important. What the Abori case did was say that nobody is untouchable, um, and I think that's really uh, important that we, we make it clear that whoever you are, however important you are in, in your eyes, you know, you can still be got at, got and uh, jailed for corruption. Yeah, before that call came mm -hmm. in from Martins, you were talking about the Nigerian election yes, yeah. and the critical moment Nigeria finds itself. It's, it's a very critical moment very, and the chances of violence yeah. are very, very high. Yeah. Is there any way that you as a PPG, Chai PPG Nigeria and Britain um, can help stop the issue of politician inciting young ones, Nigerians against one another, resulting into electoral violence, from causing damage in Nigeria. 
and then bringing their family and themselves well, abroad to you. Well, my very clear message is that we all stand to gain more by standing together for Nigeria and for the future of this amazing country with huge richness and talent and opportunity. Um, and it would be, it is, I think, incumbent first on both the presidential candidates, as I say, if they win, to win grace, graciously, um, and if they lose, to do that gracefully as well, um, and make sure that they make it clear to their followers that to violence is not tolerated. There's enough violence and death and massacre going on in Nigeria with Boko Haram, killing school children, massacring families, blowing up churches. This is not uh, this is not acceptable. Um, and I mean, you know, that's what both presidential candidates have to tackle when they're elected. So to have an infighting across pa on party political basis would be very, very unfortunate. So I think, first of all, they have to have responsibility. Certainly, and I sp I'm sure I speak for all my old party group colleagues, we would want to add our voice to that, to peace and calm after the election. If the elections happen, they're going to, you know, if they go as well as last time, they're going to be one of the best elections uh, in terms of legitimacy that Nigeria's had since democracy. Um, so they, the result needs to be taken on board. Um, and it is right that people voice their opinions, but they should do so peacefully. Um, I'm all for democratic debate, freedom of speech, even rallies and um, uh, uh, demonstrations, but peacefully, please, because there's enough blood being spilled in Nigeria. I got to some viewers before the program that said we should have a kind of a travel ban. On Nigerian positions and family members. Well, that's an interesting. That would be a very big um, diplomatic step, but I do think that it's certainly something that I will now raise with the foreign secretary to see if that's something that would be considered, because I do think that you know if I represent people and want to be living and working alongside them, and I think it, that that should not be. Uh, an escape capsule for people uh, because they've got high office and money, especially when they're elected and they're there to represent the people they're elected. They need to hang on in there and support and work with them. But I, I, yeah, I think it's something to, to take on board. Um, and we will, uh, I will ask the Foreign Secretary and I'll report back to you today on what my response is. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, let's go on this very short break. I still have a couple of more minutes with um, Meg. I've got another guest joining us now. But in the meantime, let's go on this very short break on the back and to talk more on issues around um, diaspora involvement in both Nigeria and UK politics. Don't go away. We'll be back.